see all of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We like to say around here that we are one church in multiple locations. And so that means that right now, there's a whole bunch of us all across Southwest Florida and our online family as well. Welcome to you. But a bunch of us across Southwest Florida who are uh, worshiping Jesus and gathered together in our Cape Coral location. Uh, good to be with all of you last night, Cape Coral, by the way. Uh, so fun to be at prayer meeting last night with you. Come on, sometimes you just need a good old-fashioned prayer meeting, amen? It was fun. And East location, we see you, we love you. So thankful for you. And then all of you in this room, Fort Myers, I want to forget about you. Hey, welcome, Overflow as well. Uh, welcome to you. Come on. So glad that you are in God's house today. Well, last weekend, we actually, uh, we launched and began a brand new series called Be My Witnesses. Everyone say, Be My Witnesses. And of course, it comes from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus essentially tells the disciples gathered on the hillside there and ultimately tells all of us that, that he's going to ascend to be with the Father, but then he's leaving us here. And the reason he's leaving us here is to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And by the way, if you missed last weekend, make sure you go online to nextlevelchurch.com or on our Next Level Church app or to our YouTube page. And be sure to, to watch that message and get caught up on that message because we covered a lot of ground about what Jesus left us here on this earth to do. Because according to Jesus, our faith is personal, but it's not meant to be private. So today, what I want to do is I want to, I want to give us another camera angle, if you will, on, uh, on another concept that Jesus talks about, the Bible talks about, in the New Testament. And so today, we're going to talk about being Jesus' ambassadors. But before we do that, let's, come on, let's pray together. Father, thank you. One more time. God, we just pause in this moment. Lord, I just thank you that your presence is here. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are moving among us. God, you're healing people. You're touching people today, Lord. You're setting people free today. So, Father, right now, we just give you permission to speak to us, Lord, your sons and your daughters. And Father, I pray that I would step out of myself and I could step into the anointing of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that people today would not hear me, but they would hear you. Because, God, if they hear me, they'll leave encouraged, but they won't leave changed. But if they hear you, we'll leave changed for eternity. So God, we give you permission to speak in Jesus' name and all of God's people who agreed said amen. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever, can you remember a time in your life, I'm sure it's happened to all of us, where, where you were sent with a message from someone to someone? You were sent with a message. Can you remember a time where you, in your life where you were sent with, I mean, like maybe in elementary school, and the teacher, you know, called you up uh, to her, his or her desk? Anybody remember that? And at first you thought you were in trouble? Yeah, good amen right there. A lot of us have that story, yep, right? And the teacher calls us up, says, hey, okay, I need you to run down to the office, and don't stop at the drinking fountain, don't stop at, you know, at the restroom, like, go straight to the office, and give this to the office attendant for the principal. Like, I need to get this note to the principal right away. Can you do that? Yeah, got it, right? Anybody, and you took off, and like, I don't know about you, but for me, like, when I would get, like, entrusted with a message like that, I was like, that's like invincibility, man. That's like eating the power pellets on Pac-Man. It's like, no, no, no. Like, if there's another teacher in the hallway, I'm like, I got to know. I got to know. You can't get me now, right? Because I've been sent on assignment. Or maybe, maybe your boss, you know, called you in and said, hey, we've got a client, you know, on the other side of the state or in a couple states over. And listen, I can't go, but I need you to get on an airplane right now. Or I need you to get in the car right now and drive because face to face, I need you to deliver this message to them, right? We all have a story like that or someone, you know, who, who, who said, man, I need you to take this message for that. Well, church, in 1 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul was writing to a local church in Corinth. And a city, and it was a church a lot like ours, and, and he essentially says that Jesus has sent us with a message like that. Let me show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Let's read it. It says this. We, therefore, are Christ's ambassadors. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Everyone say the word ambassadors. Okay, so let me pause for a second and bring some explanation to this. What's an ambassador? Well, essentially, an ambassador is someone with lesser authority who speaks on behalf of someone with greater authority. 
That's an ambassador. Someone who is sent with, who has lesser authority in and of themselves, but they're, they're sent on, in, to speak on behalf of someone with greater authority. For, for example, the teacher sending a student, right? Like, so the student isn't walking in the hallway in their own authority. They're walking in the hallway in the teacher's authority because they were sent with a note. For, for example, uh, when an issue comes up in the world, the United States will often send an ambassador to another country to represent the United States and to represent the president. So instead of the president going to resolve this crisis or to meet with another global leader, often they'll send, you know, the secretary of state or they'll send, you know, the secretary of foreign affairs or the, the commerce secretary or the vice president, someone with lesser authority. And here's the thing. They don't go in their own name or power. That they don't show up in the meeting when they fly across the world and land in that country and walk into an official's, a high up official's uh, office. They don't walk in in their own power, their own authority. They walk in in the power or authority of someone greater than them. Essentially, they walk in not going, ha ha, I'm here. No, no, no. They walk in going, I'm here representing the United States of America and the president of the United States. Someone with lesser authority is sent to represent and speak for someone with greater authority. And church, can I tell you something? That's our calling. God has left us here on the earth to be ambassadors for him. We are, <laughs> let's be real clear, we have lesser authority, man. We don't walk into the world in our own strength. I'm here. No, no, no. We walk in going, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a son of the king. I'm a son or daughter of the king. I represent someone with greater authority. Let me show you. Look at it again. 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are the sent ones to represent him. And then I love this next part. Look what it says. As though God were making his appeal through us. Wow. The Bible makes it clear that God is making his appeal to a lost and hurting and broken world through us. We are his ambassadors. Now, for some of us who are a little more extroverted, maybe, that thought is exhilarating. We're like, yeah, go tell it on the mount. Right? We're like, yes, I will go. I am an ambassador, baby. Okay, but for the less extroverted ones, also known as introverts, okay, and, and honestly, for, for probably a majority of us right now, the thought of us speaking on behalf of, like, of God to the world, like, it freaks us out a little bit, doesn't it? It's a little bit like, well, 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 hey, well, what, right? Because the, right? the, the minute we start thinking about talking to someone about our faith, talking to someone about Jesus, here's what we instantly do, right? Some of us were like, yeah, but, but like, I, uh, like, what if they ask me some big, deep theological question? Anybody? Come on, show hands. Yes. I worry about that. I'm like, man, I don't know. I just preach. Like, like, what if they ask, like, what about the dinosaurs? And you're like, I don't know about the dinosaur thing. Right? Or they want to start debating. We start talking to someone about Jesus, and our first thought is like, man, they're going to start this huge debate in the thing, and they're like, yeah, but the flood. And you're like, I don't know about the flood. I have a friend named Flood. Like, what do I... Right? Like, or or that like, we think if we talk about Jesus, someone's going to get offended, because we bring up such an off-limits, you know, terrible topic as religion, which, by the way, it's not religion at all. It's a relationship with Jesus. So, so, so listen, church family. Talking about Jesus, sharing our faith, being Christ's ambassadors, doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be difficult. It actually can be a very natural thing. So I want to spend the remainder of our time together today talking about that, how you and I can share our faith, be God's ambassadors to a hurting and broken and lost world around us in a, in a very natural way. So maybe you want to write this down. Let me give you three ways, three ways for us to be ambassadors for Christ. Maybe you want to take some notes today. Three ways for us to be ambassadors for Christ. See, being an ambassador for Christ is as simple, number one, as sharing our life. Number one, it's as simple as sharing 
our life. See, when you and I study the, the New Testament, it becomes clear very, very quickly that representing Jesus isn't about bullhorns or preaching at people or, or winning some theological debate. Okay, listen, by the way, you don't have to know everything to be an ambassador. Like ambassadors for the United States, they don't know everything, but they're still an ambassador, a representative of a greater authority than them. A few years ago, I got to go to uh, Costa Rica with John Maxwell on a missions trip, and, and God's using him in great ways to evangelize and reach the loss of that entire nation. And, and during our trip, we actually met with the, the United States ambassador to Costa Rica. And so one morning, we got there, went through security, and there were about a dozen or so of us, and we met uh, what a wonderful lady she is. And we sat down on her back lanai of her house there in Costa Rica in the capital. And, and for about an hour, maybe closer to an hour and a half, it was amazing for John and some of his team to just to sit and listen to, to them talk to the ambassador from the United States to Costa Rica. And in that moment, I'll, I'll be ama it was amazing to me that over that hour, hour and a half conversation, whenever John would bring up a certain strategy or a way that we were going to come and try and help the people of Costa Rica and, and add value to them, there were so many times, several times over the course of that hour or so conversation that the ambassador looked at John and she said, you know what? That's a really cool idea. I don't know. You know what? That's a great idea. I don't know. That's an interesting concept. I don't know. So just because she's the ambassador from the United States to the country, of, to the nation of Costa Rica, doesn't mean that she understands everything going on in Washington, D.C. It just means that she's there representing it. So, so many times she was able to go, you know, I don't know. But what I do know is I can call someone in Washington. I can find out about that. We can pursue that. We can work on that together. See, being an ambassador, we don't have to, to know everything or win every debate about, about Jesus and Christianity. And we don't have to know all of that. We just have to share our lives. Let me show you. First Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul, same person who wrote the book of 2 Corinthians we just read from. In 1 Thessalonians, he again is writing to a church in the city of Thessalonica. And in chapter 2, verse 8, look what he says. He says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but look at this part, but our lives as well. That even for the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest evangelists in world history, he was not just interested in sharing the gospel. He was interested in sharing the gospel and sharing our lives. Two chapters later in chapter four, verses 11 and 12, this is some, one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. It says this, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, which by the way, my mom loved that verse for me when I was a little kid, I'm sure. Hey, Matt, you talk a lot, son. Make it your ambition, Matt, to lead a quiet life. Maybe that's why I like this verse so much now. You should mind your own business Work with your hands, just as we told you. Here's why. So that your, what does it say? Daily life may win the respect of outsiders, of those who don't know, who are outside of the faith. And so that you will not be dependent on anyone. The, the, the Apostle Paul is essentially saying the best witness that we can be for Jesus is the person who, who, where, where people see how we live on a daily basis and they're intrigued by it. But here's the catch. Our lives have to actually be different enough from the world that people notice. Now here's the thing, you guys. I'm not talking about being weird. Okay, because we've all known some weird Christians, haven't we? Okay. <laughs> we have. And I'm taking your laughter right now is that it's not aimed at me. It's just an agreement with me. I, I, no, 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 it's good. I'm not talking about being weird. I'm talking about being different, being Christ-like in the way that we live, in the way that we talk, being Christ-like in our everyday life, our daily lives, in the way we act, in the, in the things we say, in our attitude, in our approach, at work. Listen, if the jokes we laugh at, if, if how we talk, if, if how we behave in our daily lives, if, if, if it's exactly like non-Christians, then guess what? People won't notice the difference. It's about sharing our lives and that our lives actually look different. Now listen, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about progress. Around here, we love to talk about what, air, what direction is your arrow pointed. Like picture more like Christ over here, less like Christ over here. 
What direction in any moment in, during your day is your arrow pointed? Is it pointed more toward becoming more like Jesus or becoming less like Jesus? So I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about being in progress, being in process, of being able to say, man, today my life looks more like Jesus than yesterday. Let me show you what Jesus had to say about it. Look, for Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. We talked about it last week too. Verse 13, this is Jesus talking. He said, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Church, we're called to be salt to the world around us, to flavor the world around us with the taste of Jesus. And what it's saying here in this verse is Jesus is essentially saying that, listen, if you lose your saltiness in the world, then the testimony of Jesus gets thrown out and trampled underfoot. Because why? Because the people in our office, the people in our neighborhood, the people in our, our, our workplace or our, our, our school, if, if, our, if we lose our saltiness, they go, yeah, 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 no, I, I know he's a Christian. I know she's a Christian. But you know what? She just kind of, there's no difference in her life or his life. They go to all the same clubs I go to and they do, do all the, they drink everything I drink. They talk that way. They, there's no difference. So what do they do? They throw out the testimony of Jesus and they go, well, then the Jesus must not mean much. And it's trampled underfoot. That's what he's talking about. We're the salt of the earth. Our lives are supposed to actually resemble Jesus. A couple weeks ago, one of our staff members had a, a new baby, their third boy, little boy. And so Sarah and I uh, went up to the hospital. And as soon as we walked in the room, uh, we greeted them. And then we looked at the baby. And as, like the first thing out of my mouth when I walked in the room was, wow, he looks just like your other two boys. Because he does. And don't worry, they're really cute kids. So it's, it's good. It's good. It's good. But like, right. The kid is supposed to look like mom and dad. The kid is supposed to look like his brothers, right? So it's, yes, and that's what God wants for us. Our lives are supposed to look like our father. Our lives are supposed to look like brother Jesus. We're supposed to look like him. We are Christ's ambassadors when our daily lives are attractive to the world around us. So how's your life? Is it attractive? Is it salty? Like, not like salty, like culturally. Oh, that was salty. oh he got salty. Not that. <laughs> not that. Is it salty like McDonald's french fries? Come on, somebody. <sighs> just, just give me a minute. Some of us during these 21 days of prayer are fasting as well, and I'm going to need a minute on that one. <laughs> so how, do, how, are, how are we God's ambassadors? Number one, by sharing our, our, our life. Here's number two. Number two, uh, being a, an ambassador for Christ looks like sharing our story. Looks like sharing our story. See, when we think evangelism, which by the way, the word evangelism is kind of a big Bible word that essentially means sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, So when we think about evangelism, the most powerful tool we have at our disposal as followers of Jesus is our story. It's not bullhorns or theological debates. It's not being able to answer every question or every tangent that people want to get, uh, get hung up on. It's not about being able to know, well, what did happen to the dinosaur? I don't know. It's our personal story of what Jesus has done for us. And remember, church, we're not talking about religion at all. We're talking about a relationship with Jesus. Our life has been changed by Jesus. There's this amazing story in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, Jesus is in the height of his ministry, and he comes across a blind man. And his disciples come up to him, and they want to get all religious and, and about it. And they say, okay, so Jesus, this guy was born blind. So who sinned, his mom and dad or him? And Jesus looks at them, and he's like, you guys, nobody sinned. This happened so that the glory of God can be made manifest in our midst right now. So Jesus, then he spits in the mud. Don't know how to explain that either. And he puts the mud on this guy's eyes. And the Bible records that when he clears away the anointing salve, this mud, on his eyes, for the first time in his life, he can see. And so he starts running around. It's a miracle. He starts running around. And everybody starts looking. Go, wait, is that the beggar? 
Is that the guy that used to beg at the gate? And he sure looks, I don't know if that's the guy, but he sure looks like the guy who used to beg at the gate. So they're like, hey, buddy, what happened to you? He's like, man, some guy named Jesus, he spit in the mud, put it on my eyes, and now I can see. And they're like, really? That's interesting, because today's the Sabbath, and, and, and you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. The Old Testament tells us that, right? And he's like, I don't know. I, can't, I couldn't see. Now I can see. They're like, well, wait a minute. Are you really that guy that's been blind since birth? He's like, yep. And they're like, get your parents. So they go and find the dude's parents. They're bringing the parents. Is this your son? Yep, this is our son. Was he blind at birth? Yep, he was. You can ask him. He's an adult. They're like, we already asked him. Now we're asking you. I'm telling you, it's all in there. You don't have to read it. I want you to read it, but I just put, I put, did the, I literally told you the whole story. All right, I'll do all the work. So then they bring in the religious guys, Pharisees. And they're like, hey, look, this guy was blind. Some guy named Jesus touched him. And as soon as they heard Jesus, they start freaking out. They're like, what? The sinner? That guy, the false prophet, the false teacher, like, and they start questioning the whole thing. And they finally look at the, they're Pepper and the, the blind guy, formerly blind guy with all these questions. And I love what he says. Look at this, verse 25, John chapter 9, verse 25. He replied to the religious people, whether, speaking of Jesus, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, now I can see. That's what I got. He shared his story. Church, he couldn't debate with the religious guys. He couldn't, he couldn't hold water to the religious arguments of the day. What did he have? He had his story. And each one of us have a story like that. I once was blind, but now I can see. I once was blank, but now I'm free. I used to complain. I got saved at 15 and called into ministry at 16. The first couple years, I used to complain to Sarah that I didn't have a testimony because I was a good kid, right? And I was like, man, oh, man. And then when I was 19 years old, I got in a snow sledding accident. And that's the story for another day. But suffice it to say, God spared my life. God saved my life. Hey, church, I almost died. But God saved my life. I used to think I didn't have a testimony. I just had no idea how far God wanted to bring me. Listen, I once was bound by addiction, but God set me free. I used to struggle with anger, but God set me free. I felt like an orphan, but God gave me a family. I used to be bound with fear, but God set me free. I used to be caught up in people pleasing, but God set me free. I could go on and on. That's my story. And every one of us have a story. I once was, but now I'm free. That's the story of Jesus. Listen, share your story. And church, can I just say this? Listen, you don't have to defend every other Christian who, who has given Jesus a bad name. Because that happens from time to time. Somebody goes, oh yeah, no, I knew a Christian. No, I went to a church one time. Oh, I got burned by that church. Oh, man, that church, all oh, they would have. Like, they've got, they've got their thing. Hey, listen, here's, here's what I do. I will just look at someone in that moment and just go, listen, I'm so sorry that that happened. I'm so sorry they represented Jesus that way. And I, listen, I don't know all the details of that. Here's what I do know. I'm sorry you had a bad experience. But what I know is what Jesus did for me. And I just believe if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Come on, somebody. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Amen. So church, I want to challenge you. Start sharing your story. Begin to see opportunities in your world to share what Jesus has done for you unashamedly. We are Christ's ambassadors when we share our story. So how do we, how do we embody this? How do you and I be God's ambassadors? Well, here's how. Number three, by sharing an invitation. Sharing our life, sharing our story, sharing an invitation. <laughs> Back to the, the story of the blind guy, formerly blind guy, in John chapter 9. Well, how would you like, you know, if Jesus opened your eyes and for the rest of human history in the Bible, it's recorded that you're the blind guy. Like, no, he's not. He's the formerly blind guy. <laughs> I hereby change your title, my friend. See you later, right? Like, I was going to say see you soon. Don't, no, 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 I got a long way to go. <laughs> anyway. John chapter 9, I love it. So the religious guy, so he tells him, man, it was me. I was, yeah, that was me. Like, Jesus set me free. I don't know about all that. He set me free, right? They start pestering again, pestering him again about it. And look what he says in verse 27. I love this. Verse 27, he says, I have told you already, and you didn't listen. They're like, well, wait, wait, no. So wait, so you were laying there, so a guy named Jesus walked. He's like, guys, I told you already. You didn't listen. And then I love this. He goes, why do you want to hear it again? And then can't you hear just a, with a hint of sarcasm in his voice? Do you want to become disciples too? 
He's like, if he did it for me, he could do it for you. I once was blind, now I'm right. I love it. It's the power of an invitation. Think about it. When Jesus was assembling the 12 disciples, his strategy wasn't to find the most religious guys. His strategy wasn't to find the most scholarly people, the smartest people. His, his strategy was to find the B team. Like he found some fishermen and a tax collector. Like these guys, like that's the low, the tax collector. Like he's the low, his name was Matthew, by the way. Lowest on the totem pole. No relation. What was Jesus' strategy? Ready? Here it is. Come follow me. No tests, no quizzes, no classes they had to sit through, no textbooks. Just come follow me. Just an invitation. Just come follow me. Because I just think if you get around Jesus, your life will be changed. For the vast majority of us listening today, in all of our locations, online family, you too, the vast majority of us our faith journey began or was restarted by an invitation, wasn't it? You know what? Come on. Show of hands. Show of hands right now. Every, Cape Coral, East, this room, overflow, online, ready? Show of hands. If in some, some way, shape, or form, an invitation was extended to you, maybe it was a Facebook share and somebody posted that, or maybe, so, but, but in some way, shape, or form, there was an invitation process lived out that jump-started your faith or began your faith in Jesus, and you are where you are today because of an invitation. Raise your hand right now. Come on. Raise your hand. My goodness. Hundreds and hundreds and all. The, the majority of us. Majority of us. That's us. Someone simply offered an invitation. That was my story. You've heard me tell it if you've been around Next Level. I was 15 years old, and my then-girlfriend, Sarah, invited me to an Easter musical on Easter weekend at her, her parents' church, and I came, and my life was changed forever. That's the power of an invitation. Church, we can all leverage the power of an invitation. You don't have to have all the answers to offer an invitation. You don't have to have your life all together to offer an invitation. Most people are one invitation away. So, as you heard me say last weekend, if you were in church, if you weren't, again, make sure you go back and, and watch it. Two weeks from today, September 11th, Sunday morning, Sunday, September 11th, we are launching a brand new series called What's the Point? Everyone say, What's the Point? And the series, the four-week series called What's the Point is based off of my brand new book that's coming out called Donkey Mission. Everyone say Donkey Mission. And so, by the way, uh, this book, I'm really excited about it. Um, it comes from the story in 1 Samuel chapter 9 where Saul, a man named Saul, his father Kish, sends him on a mission that, that seems pointless to go find some lost donkeys. And he goes out looking for lost donkeys on a pointless mission and he comes back, encounters a prophet, and comes back anointed the first king over Israel. So the whole concept of the book is how our pointless missions in life, our donkey missions, point us and lead us to our greater missions in life. So I'm really excited about the book. And so as you heard me say last week, the book goes on sale nationally September the 12th, Monday, September the 12th. But for all of us here at Next Level Church at all three of our locations today, the book is on sale today for all of you. Yes. So uh, the book is $15 retail. But what we've done, as I said last weekend, what we've done is we have bundled the books in packages of four. And we've discounted the book by $10 per book. So the book is available for $5 each. So a bundle for $20, $5 each. And the reason why we've done that is because inside of each one of these books is an invitation card that looks like this. It's on your seat with you right there, inviting people to the series called What's the Point? Launching in two weeks, two weeks from today. And so church family, here's what we're hoping that you'll do. We're hoping that you'll go and buy four copies at minimum, and you can buy as many as you want for $5 a piece in bundles of four. Uh, today, at all of our locations, we have stations out in the foyer. And so our hope is that you'll buy at least four and that you'll keep one for yourself and be able to read it and enjoy it, start reading it. But then take the other three 
and use them as invitation cards to invite people in your world to be able to say, listen, I care about you. I care about our friendship. I care about this relationship enough that, that when I heard about this book, my pastor wrote a book. And so uh, when I heard about the concept in this book, I thought of you and you give them the book to, to, and I think it will really bless your life and help you. And so I just want to give you this book as, as uh, for free to just bless your life. But then you can also point, draw their attention to the card inside and say, oh, and by the way, in two weeks, my church is, having a, is doing a series based on some of the concepts in the book. And we're going to have fun, and I would love for you to come with me and be my guest in church on that opening Sunday or for the weeks of the series. And there's, we're going to do a lot of fun things, petting zoo the first weekend. If there's stuff for kids, it's going to be amazing. It's a simple way for us to simply leverage or share an invitation. It's never been easier to invite unchurched people to church, to come to church with you. So we want you to take advantage of that today. Make sure that you grab, stop before you leave the building today. Grab a, a bundle of these uh, at least. Why? Because we're Christ's ambassadors. He's making his appeal through us, which by the way, if you go to donkeymission.com, you'll notice that it's a whole lot about churches because there are a lot of other churches that are going to be doing the series with us. I think we're at about 50 churches right now that are going to be participating with us. Yeah, which is awesome. And you'll hear me talking to them. Some of them are going to use some of our message videos and that sort of thing in the future. But, um, but let me say this. Some of you, you come from, like you moved to Southwest Florida from somewhere else and you were a part of a great church. Grab a book for that pastor and, and write in it and send it to them and just say, hey, by the way, if you go to donkeymission.com, again, which is all the information on the back of the book, they can register their church. It's all free. We just want to help churches grow uh, this fall and into next spring. We just believe this could be a tool that God could use to reach thousands and thousands of people. So if you know of another church, uh, by all means, uh, let them know about that. And we'd love, to, we'd love for them to participate and be a part of it. Make sense? God called us to be his ambassadors as if Jesus were making his appeal through us. Church, what could happen? What could God do with a whole bunch of us sharing our lives, sharing our story, and sharing an invitation? What could Jesus do? I believe, here's what I believe. I believe in the coming months, we're going to hear hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories of loved ones, of coworkers, of friends, of people we knew, of relations, of pe uh, uh, waiters and waitresses and, and drive-through workers and, and doctors and nurses and, and that we've taken a book in with us at an appointment and they show up at our church and they go, you know what, months from now, we're gonna hear stories, hundreds of them, I believe it, of people who go, you know what, somebody walked in and they handed me this book and I thought it was a little weird, but then I realized they weren't weird. Just kidding. They handed me this book and I started to read it. And, I, and then I came to the church and I, Jesus has changed my life. I believe we're going to hear hundreds of stories like that. What could God do with a church like ours, full of people who are willing to share our lives, share our stories, and share an invitation? So, Father, right now I thank you for this place. God, thank you that you have planted us in this house. And God, we're so thankful. We're so ready, God. We want to be used by you. And so, Lord, I thank you that you've given us our story. And Lord, would you help us, God, to see differently our world, the people in our world, to just start to share pieces of our story that could make a difference in someone else's life about what you, how you've made a difference in ours. God, I pray for those who, as I was talking about sharing our life and that our life actually needs to be different than the world around us, God, I just believe that there were some that that, that conviction kind of hit us. Not condemnation, just conviction. And so, Lord, right now, sitting right where we are, Lord, we just repent. God, forgive us for going with the flow. Forgive us for losing our saltiness. God, would you help us to live differently? To not laugh at all the jokes people laugh at and just do what all, everybody else is doing and people who don't know you. God, we don't judge them. We just, you just called us to something better. You just called us to something higher. And so, Lord, we just repent. Lord, we turn from that. And we dedicate ourselves to a life that looks different, like Paul wrote about. And then, Jesus, I pray that a spirit of evangelism would come upon your people. That, God,
God, you would use us to leverage an invitation. God, thank you for this book. The simple, small read that it is that's so relevant to where people are living today. God, may it help people as they read it and digest the information. May it start thousands and thousands of conversations across our cities. Staying in this moment of prayer, let me just, with every head bowed, let me ask you a question. If you don't know Jesus today, that's your first step. You can know him. Do you want to know him? You're surrounded by hundreds of people right now in the room you're in whose lives have been changed for eternity because of Jesus. And I just want to give you an opportunity right now to say yes to Jesus. So if you're here today and you want to say yes, would you just slip your hand up right now? One, two, three. Pastor Matt, that's me. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. We don't have to earn it. You're not joining a church. You're just, you're putting your faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if we'll do that, if we'll acknowledge we're a sinner and believe that what Jesus did on the cross was payment for our sin, he'd come and he'd forgive us. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Just slip your hand up. Pastor Matt, that's me. Keep it up for just a second. Awesome. Thank you. Fantastic. Anybody else? Cape Coral, East Location. Online family, just note that in the chat and one of our team will help you there. God, thank you that You are the God who forgives sins. And so, Lord, by lifting our hand right now, God, we just acknowledge that we need a Savior. Would you come into our life? God, would you forgive us of our sin? Lord God, the way we've been living isn't working, and we need need you. So, God, we ask you, forgive us of our sin. God, we turn. Lord, thank you for putting us in the family of God, for calling us sons and daughters of God today. We receive you. We say yes in Jesus' name. And then, Father, I pray for each person that, God, as we leave today, we would go as ambassadors, those with lesser authority who are living and speaking on behalf of you, our God with all authority. I pray blessing on them in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said, amen. Come on, let's give God praise, everybody.